All right, welcome to Refuge Recovery World Services, uh, first Thursday offering. Welcome to anybody that's new here. Um, I always like to begin by reminding everybody that this is not a refuge recovery meeting. Uh, refuge recovery meetings are peer led. This is a world services uh, offering teacher led where I will give some meditation instructions and some kind of a talk and we can have some Q&A and we'll spend about an hour, maybe a little bit more depending on where the conversation goes. And uh, welcome to everybody. Glad that you're here. And uh, I'm happy to be here with you. We'll start by meditating for 20 minutes or so. So find a way to sit that is upright, relaxed, take your meditation posture. And as you're ready, allowing your eyes to be closed. And settling into the body, mindfulness, present time awareness. Releasing any unnecessary tension in the face, shoulders, belly. Think about softening into the posture or relaxing into the upright seated posture. Just allowing the awareness to land with the sensations that the breath creates. The other sense doors of hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and thinking. Receding to the background as we intentionally direct our attention, our awareness, our mindfulness to the breath. Breathing in, know that you're breathing in, investigate the breath. Where do you feel it? Or is it most easy to feel? If you can just get a sense of knowing that you're breathing in and out as the primary object of awareness, do that. If you find it helpful to note in and out with each inhale and exhale, you can use that technique. And of course, the attention doesn't stay long. We feel some breaths and then a thought calls for our attention. We get back into the awareness, returns to the thinking mind, planning, remembering. So for now, just come back to the breath, disengage from the thoughts, return to the breath.
it's helpful if you bring a deeper level of interest to what's happening moment to moment in your body. Where do you feel the breath? Where does it enter and exit? Does the breath have a texture, maybe a feeling tone, pleasant or unpleasant? Becoming aware of the beginning, middle and end of each inhalation. The beginning, middle and end of each exhale. I think spent a few minutes stabilizing the attention with the breath, returning to the breath over and over, and begin to expand to include the rest of the body. Feel your upright posture resting in the chair, on the cushion, couch, wherever you're sitting. opening to the investigation of the second foundation, the feeling tone, what is being perceived as pleasant or unpleasant or neutral in the body. 
Bring your attention to your hands. How do they feel resting in your lap or on your legs? Bring your attention to your feet. To your arms and legs, torso, back. Shoulders, head, face. Investigating the impermanent nature of sensation, how each breath comes and goes, each sensation constantly changing. Opening to the other sense doors of sound. Just listening, mindful, receptive awareness. Whatever sounds are happening in your space that you're sitting in, the sound of my voice coming and going. Opening to include the mind rather than ignoring it, turn your attention towards your mind. Third foundation, the quality of observing what thoughts are here, what moods, kind of attitude the mind has right now. Trying to observe thoughts passing through awareness like bubbles in an open space. Plans and memories, hopes and fears. Some thoughts are pleasant, some are unpleasant, some are neutral. Awareness of the mind, of the body, and the connection between the mind and body. some fear or craving arrives and arises in the mind you may notice that the body gets tight the belly hardens or the jaw clenches 
See what happens when you soften your belly, you release your jaw. Sometimes it helps to relax the mind, to release the negative thoughts or feelings that are here, soften around them. Mindful awareness of the impermanent nature of all of our experience, all thoughts arising and passing, all sensations, emotions. Awareness of how we tend to try to cling and Get attached to the pleasant experiences that are impermanent and the suffering that comes from our attachment. The instinctual tendency to meet unpleasant experiences with aversion and the suffering that comes from resistance, aversion, And I invite you to spend the last couple of minutes reflecting on gratitude, inclining the mind, the heart towards appreciation, gratitude. Let yourself think about what you're grateful for, what you appreciate about your life today, your recovery.
When you're ready, you can allow your eyes to open, bring your attention back to the space you're in, the screen, the sangha, virtual sangha here gathered. Talking with a friend earlier before class about what to, to discuss with the Sangha tonight. And uh, we started to talk about gratitude and how central it is in recovery and in, in so many of our recovery practices and how um, it's not actually addressed as, as a very central teaching um, in some ways in the Refuge Recovery book. Um, in Refuge Recovery, we have the meditation practice on appreciation and developing a quality of, of gratitude and appreciation for our own experiences of well being joy, uh, success, and, and developing a quality of appreciation for other people's happiness and joy and, and success. The Buddha said that after his awakening, um, it was just a, it was natural to him when, when he was freed from greed and hatred and delusion. He said all that remained was this quality of um, empathizing and appreciating the happiness of others. No more jealousy, no more envy, no more comparing mind tendency. And that a sense of, uh, Gratitude and appreciation is the natural outcome of healing and recovering and awakening. And it's my part of my sense is that uh, when we, whatever suffering it is, the, the suffering of addiction that brings us to get involved with recovery and start our process of healing and recovering and establishing and maintaining abstinence and then doing the meditation that we're doing and the inventories that we do and the service that we engage in this whole process. That there's a natural, uh, like there was for the Buddha, there's a natural feeling of gratitude and appreciation that starts to come. That um, life gets so much better. And in the beginning, you know, if there's anybody new here tonight or listening to this later on YouTube, when you're brand new to recovery, it doesn't feel like there's much to be grateful for <laughs> most of the time. We're going to feel like, oh man, my life has come to this. <laughs> but after some time in recovery, um, most people that are actually doing the work, not just abstinent, not just, but actually doing the meditative experience and do the service and, and engage with community and, and um, the eightfold path when you're really working it, really doing it. I think there's a natural sense of I'm so grateful for where my uh, life is going for the skills of uh, compassion and non-attachment and um, kindness that are starting to, uh, I'm starting to develop, that are starting to be uncovered. And, you know, sometimes it's little things, you know, like just being grateful for not having hangovers or being grateful for not um, being stuck in obsession. 
you know, when you get to that place where you're no longer in the cravings and the obsessions and that misery of active addiction, and but you still remember it. Like, I'm so grateful I don't live in that hell realm, that hungry ghost realm, when uh, I was just obsessed all of the time with escaping and changing and manipulating the way that I feel. And at some point, hopefully, I don't know how many of you are there, but at some point you get to the place where you're like, just so grateful that I don't live there anymore, that I'm not in that constant suffering. So I think, um, you know, I was referring to the Buddha's awakening and how, you know, he said, if you just keep doing a lot of mindfulness, 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 and renunciation, this eightfold path, the ethics, the careful communication, careful with our actions, with our sexuality, with all of it, that will, you know, come to a place of natural gratitude and appreciation. That does seem, it seems true to me. It seems like, you know, we're on a path that will lead to, if you, if, if you keep going, it'll lead to a place of feeling quite appreciative and grateful and free from uh, believing that tendency of mind that feels jealous or compares ourselves to others. Not necessarily that the mind will stop doing that altogether, but we just stop believing it. Part of our awareness as we start to see those aren't trustworthy thoughts they're not true they're not worth engaging in too much so that feels true and, and like a lot of what we're doing on this recovery path this practicing of the buddha's dharma and then what also feels true to me and maybe they're contradictory, but I don't think so, is um, that we can't, in my experience anyways, uh, wait for the natural gratitude, just, just the natural gratitude, that actually gratitude and appreciation, that's why we have the appreciative joy instructions. It's a meditation that we develop. It's a part of our heart and mind that we need to train. I think that one of the reasons why Buddhism starts by acknowledging the suffering, first noble truth, the suffering, the suffering of addiction, the suffering of, of existence with this human mind and heart and body, is because that's the um, common ground. We all, we all experience that. And because we live with a mind that um, has like a, a negativity bias, that uh, sometimes gratitude takes a lot of effort. A lot of people in recovery do gratitude lists or have gratitude groups, or that actually we have to train the mind to focus on what's right, because the mind is naturally uh, habituated to looking for threats, to looking for what's not right, for what's, what I'm not grateful for, <laughs> for what I'm not happy about, for what might be unpleasant or difficult or um, what's wrong rather than what's right. There's a Buddha saying that we live in a world of uh, 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. But if you look at your own mind, your own attitude, outlook, do you tend to focus on the sorrow or the joy? And there can be something here around not, uh, we're not all the same and we don't have all the, we don't all have the same personality types. So we don't have all the same. The Buddha said there was different personality types. 
that some of us have a, a natural tendency towards um, sort of pessimism and negativity and aversion. And that, you know, like it's quite, you know, we get quite focused on what's wrong. And that some of us have a, a personality that's a little bit more optimistic and positive and focuses on what's good, what's right. And some of us have a personality, he said, that are um, a bit diluted, <laughs> where we're not so focused on the external what's right or what's wrong that we're just sort of in a self-centered delusion. Uh, I didn't really mean to go down this, but it's, it is a little bit interesting. I don't think I addressed it in the book. Um, but it said that there's these three personality types and that you can diagnose yourself whether you have this, uh, it's, he, he categorizes them as greed and hatred and delusion, personality types. And that if you have a greed personality type, when you first walk into a new space, and maybe we could even do this like in a Zoom room. Um, it's harder in a Zoom room because you don't see as much, but you see the people. Um, but when you walk into a room, that uh, if, if you have a greed type, you probably notice what you like about the room first. Like if you look around, like if you were in this room that I'm in, you see this big painting behind me, you'd see some other paintings, you'd see the carpets, the chairs, the cushions, the light fixtures, the couch, the table, you would see all of these things. And the, the greed personality type, um, would first notice what they like about it. And then maybe, you know, they might say, oh, I really like the painting, but I don't like the carpet. The aversive personality type, and you might know this, some of you have this for sure, some of us. <laughs> um, you walk into the room and first you would see what you don't like. You'd be like, oh, that carpet is gross. And there's holes in those chairs. And, um, you know, one of those you know, light fixtures is on the fritz. You know, first, first see what's wrong with this picture. <laughs> what do I not like about this picture? And then after that, you might come around to be like, oh, but I, I like the art or I like the, but the negative first. And the delusional type might um, not have noticed the carpet, the chairs or the art. <laughs> Because they were busy thinking about themselves the whole time until you know until you mention it, and then they might still be like, ah, whatever, it's fucking another another Buddha, whatever. <laughs> so depending on you know, gratitude uh, might be a little bit easier for some of the personality types, and might take more effort for others. So this is one of the places where it can be quite interesting to have more insight on our personality tendencies and not take it so personally, but to say like, oh, it's kind of how my mind works. So my mind needs more balance. I need to um, practice more appreciation, more gratitude. I need to intentionally look at what's good because my mind's constantly reminding me what's not good what's not pleasant, what's not right about this world. And, you know, like if you turn on the news, the news is telling you what's wrong. It's almost never the good news. It's all of the bad news. What, what, are, what are the terrible things that happened on the planet today or in your city or in your, um, and, you know, and, and it's like that because that's what we want. We'll get the ratings. That's what we pay attention to, what's wrong. So I went on a little bit of a tangent there, but um, the importance of intentionally reflecting on what we are thankful for, what we appreciate about our own life, about our recovery, to balance um, the tendency to look at what we're suffering about, 
and to also make the uh, bring the awareness of what am I not suffering about? What am I appreciating? Maybe the last thing I'll open to some conversation with y'all. Um, like all of Buddhism, we need to find a balance. The balance of acknowledging the suffering and the difficulty and the, that we're experiencing and meeting that with as much acceptance and compassion, not ignoring the pain. And the balance of also looking at um, what's pleasant and what's good and what are we grateful for. And that if we have too much focus on just the suffering, it becomes a bit overwhelming, maybe unbearable. And if we have too much focus on just the goodness and the gratitude, there's um, a level of denial and ignorance in thinking it's all good all of the time, because actually we're ignoring all of the truth that there's quite a bit of suffering to be addressed. So finding that balance of knowing that there is all of this joy to be experienced and all of this sorrow to be experienced. It just reminded me of a um, Buddhist practice that um, is it's like almost a, a request or like almost like a prayer that says, may I be met with the appropriate difficulties today so I have the opportunity to respond with compassion. And it's almost like having gratitude for challenging experiences so that we can deepen our experience of compassion. How counter instinctual is that? Where, you know, we're going through life going like, I hope nothing difficult happens. <laughs> I want to avoid everything unpleasant. But when we get solidly focused on the importance of compassion and we start to wake up to like, oh, this difficulty uh, I'm grateful for because I, it's helping me heal, it's helping me awaken, it's preparing me for all of the other difficulties that will inevitably arise in my life. So maybe gratitude, not just for the pleasant stuff, but also sometimes when we have the capacity uh, and the perspective that we also feel grateful for the difficulties. So I'll open it up um, for some dialogue with anybody who would like to, any questions, any comments, any clarifications about what I'm saying. Um, I'll also say that, so you can raise your hand in the, um, reactions button and then I can call on you. Um, I see a couple hands going up or one, one so far. Also say that I'm kind of very slowly working on a new um, version of the book, uh, uh, the second edition of the Refuge Recovery book. And uh, this is one of the things when I look at the first edition that I feel like was missing a little bit. Like it's, we talk a little bit about appreciation I, I, you know, in the book, but that we could actually use a bigger section on, on um, actual practical like gratitude lists and, um, you know, training the mind to, to be grateful in this way. So uh, Michael, go ahead and unmute yourself if it'll let you. Uh, yeah, thanks yeah. a lot, Noah. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, Michael here. And I just uh, raised my hand because I just want to say I'm grateful for uh, the meditation and your uh, talk and uh, a couple things like just to comment on in, in the meditation in of the feeling tone part. Um, I really love that so much. And it reminds me of I used to read a lot of fantasy when I was a kid. And, and I remember this one uh, story about uh, some some kid was like, you know, training to be a wizard and uh, his uh, you know mentor basically saying, if you know the true name of something, you have power over it. And I was like, you know, that's so true. In in the Buddhist practice, for me, it's like when I can name like my emotion and when I can name that feeling tone, it's not that I have power over it. It's it doesn't have power over me, you know. And I <laughs> I just thought of that that wizard school thing. And, and uh, that was pretty cool. Um, thanks for that. And then the other thing is like, in terms of uh, being grateful, um, you know, that's, 
you know, I needed the blunt instrument of AA when I was first rec uh, in recovery and, uh, you know, finding refuge um, along the way was just exactly what I needed. And I still do AA as well. And, you know, as you know, the gratitude part is, uh, is a big part of it. And uh, so that's, that's really cool. Uh, you know, it just dovetails really nicely um, with this program. And I think it's great that you're going to, you know, put a little emphasis on that as well in the, in the new version. Pretty cool, man. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, man, that's it. Thanks. Thanks, my, thanks Michael. Wait, but before you go, I have a yeah. question for you. Um, first of all, I love the, the wizard training. Yes, the kind <laughs> of when we know the true name and the awareness that we bring to things. Um, I was thinking about that, like, you know, in the 12 step world, gratitude lists are such a thing. And I don't know how deeply, uh, but I couldn't think of anywhere in the big book where it's really a practice. Yeah, it's not like formally talked about. You're right. It's more of a kind of an accrued um, tradition. Because right. that's sort of what's happening in Refuge, too, where it's not really in the book, but it's becoming. And I think it's where I started the talk, where it's like people just get fucking grateful to be in recovery and then say, like, hey, let's focus on this because it's so much better to be in gratitude than in resentment or, you know. Yeah, um, exactly. And the other thing that, that, that AA is actually um, interesting in terms of that gratitude is, is, you know, they talk a lot about the pink cloud which yeah. is for those that don't know, it's basically, you know, in some early stage recovery, everything is just so awesome because you're not hung over, you're not drunk, you can, you can get shit done. You can, you know where you are most places, you can find your car keys, you got the <laughs> shoes on the right feet, whatever. And you're just like so happy, yeah. <laughs> you know? And then, and then, you know, life actually starts happening and uh, that's where, you know, the tools come in that AA and Refuge you know, can provide for us. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Michael. Nice to see you. Yeah. Nice to see you as well. Ron, go ahead. Hi, Noah. So nice to meet you. Thank you for, uh, thank you for doing this talk. Um, it's funny, just as I was thinking of a question, you started talking about refining the book. Um, and one thing I, I noticed from what you're talking about earlier about these, I was just laughing at, um, you know, praying that we just don't have anything difficult happen throughout the day. And it just, just, you know, mind blow emoji, like thinking about meditating on, you know, intentionally hoping for the challenges so you can practice compassion. Um, one thing I noticed that when sort of unexpected uh, difficulties come up, um, not necessarily, um, you know, a, a threat to my sobriety, but um, craving happens like really hard and i noticed in the book um the the saying in the meditation may be happy may it's on my wall may you be at ease may you be free from suffering i was wondering if you have like a a 2.0 or maybe even a request to have like an, an alternate or additional compassionate phrase or phrases to meet that kind of craving with yeah one of the other um I mean, I'm, yes, we can, we can expand upon that. Um, I, I could, there's lots of different things. One of the other phrases in that, you know, loving kindness meditation, uh, I believe it says something like, you know, or, or say any other phrases that are meaningful to you that have this. Um, so I'm actually a big fan when I'm, it's so hard when you're trying to teach, every, you know, a whole bunch of people a technique. You have to do this sort of generalized technique, but it's important to also individualize it and uh, sometimes come up with your own phrases. What feels like a, a, a loving or a kind or a compassionate phrase to you? And then include that, train your mind with what feels like a, a because you know, sticking with these traditional phrases is good. And I just stuck with the kind of traditional phrases because my, for my first many years of practice, I just said those over and over, even though I didn't mean them. <laughs> and then I started to mean them and I started to feel it and felt like, okay, this is, um, this works. So it worked for me. I'm sure it'll work for, you know, it's worked for all of these Buddhists for all of these years. So we'll stick with these, this simple, uh, way of saying it. 
but totally good to expand and get creative. And um, I could certainly come up with some alternatives for uh, guided meditations for the, the next uh, edition of the book. And, and I will. So we don't have to stick with, um, we don't have to become fundamentalist or anything like that and be like, well, that's first edition. So we need to stick with it. Like, fuck that. Let's evolve as we, as we go. Um, Ginny. Thank you so much for the teaching um, tonight. Um, I have a question. And that is, have you considered doing virtual retreats for those of us who can't travel or would you come to Oregon? Those are my two questions. Yeah. Um, I'll answer the second one first, uh, which is I'd be happy to do a refuge recovery retreat in Oregon or somewhere uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And I have actually for many years taught retreats in Oregon and Washington. Um, post pandemic, I just haven't uh, had the inv invitations or infrastructure um, to, you know, to do it, but I'm, I'm happy to come back up that way and do some retreats. And then um, I just wanted to express um, deep gratitude for, um, for the practice. I've been sober, completely sober for five months. Um, and it's changed my mind. And, um, I went back down south for my daughter's um, college graduation and I did forgiveness meditations every day because there's always a chance that my mother would go off on me. And, um, you know, when she did, um, I asked for her forgiveness and she said, absolutely not. And um, it was like a switch. And that voice in my head for my whole life that was what's wrong with you not even your mother loves you turned into compassion of what could have happened to my mother to make her this angry and um i just got up and i left um which it was great to be sober right because i could drive away um but um the forgiveness you know as, as she sat there and told me all the terrible things that I am, um, I just kept, you know, repeating any way I have harmed her through my thoughts, words, and actions, I, I forgive her. Um, and I would not have been able, but just that compassion helped me um, to quiet that voice. And I haven't heard that voice since. Um, I text her occasionally. But um, I'm 50 years old, and it's time to stop being called stupid and ugly and a whore. And so I'm so appreciative of the practice yes. and of the community. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, that's, a, you know, what a beautiful sort of testimonial to like this shit works when we apply it and we train our mind and then we can navigate those really difficult, unavoidable, you know, interactions with the uh, with our family or whoever. So thanks, Jim. My sangha really has um, has supported me, um, and I'm very grateful for the sangha. Yeah. And then I still want to ask about virtual retreats. Thank you. Um, I two things. Um, I don't really like this. <laughs> Teaching, like being just in front of a, uh, so my, my own sort of bias is I don't, I don't love just kind of sitting in front of a computer and talking to the squares, the spiritual Zoom squares of your all faces. Um, so that my own kind of preferences. And then when it comes to retreat, part of what happens on retreat is all of us being together and following a schedule together. Um, there's, a, there's a big Sangha part of retreat that, um, you, you know, we get it in the meetings, you know, spending an hour together and talking to each other and uh, it works, you know, Zoom, Zoom works for, for meetings. But for a retreat when you're in silence, noble silence, 
there's, so, you know, it can work a little bit of like, at least I see there's other people here showing up and meditating, but I'm at home. I have all the distractions of home. I have all the responsibilities of home or, or whatever. Um, my sense is that it doesn't work that well to do virtual retreats. Um, you can't reproduce the retreat experience of being with a whole bunch of other people on a schedule in noble silence uh, on the computer. It's, a, it's an in-person experience. Um, I should probably let go of that and um, do an online refuge recovery retreat and know that although it's not the same, it'd still be beneficial. I, I know that it would still be beneficial to people, um, but it's not quite, it wouldn't be quite as good. And, um, you know, to really do it, people would have to say, okay, I'm going to, um, you know, be at home and I'm going to do this retreat and I'm going to completely turn my phone off and not look at my email and never turn the television on and be in silence at home. And it's fucking hard, way easier to leave home and go somewhere else to do that level of renunciation. It's like, um, you know, you're around all of the stuff that you want to engage with to distract you uh, when you're at home. So I'll consider it. Amy, go ahead. In the um, beginning of the pandemic, um you did a day long and I thought that was useful and we were silent yeah. for like yeah. good days, but something like that. That's all. I did. But I agree with everything else you said. The, the whole experience can't be replicated on the computer. Yeah. Yeah. And I have the intention to, um, you know, we, we are having this situation with refuge where we're scheduling a retreat and even this North Carolina retreat where we were able to let 80 people in, there's over a hundred people on the waiting list. So the reality is we need a retreat center um, and lots of retreat centers around the country that, you know, either do a whole bunch of smaller refuge retreats or to have some retreat centers where 200 people can come and we can all do the retreat together and just have a, a, a big, huge 200 person retreat. Um, so this year's retreat schedule is finished for me, but next year for 23, um, I will do my best to get a whole bunch of refuge retreats on the schedule and in various places, the Pacific Northwest and the East Coast and maybe even the South, who knows? We'll, we'll try not to do them all in California. Time for one more question or comment, or we can leave it there. If you're not um, really doing any kind of gratitude stuff, experiment with it. Take, you know, do the next week or two uh, of daily reflecting and writing uh, some of the stuff that you're grateful for about your life, about your recovery, about the experiences that you're having about the world. Uh, what do you appreciate? And focus your attention on some of the pleasure, the healthy, pleasant experiences that you're having. And maybe even on some of that list, uh, usually in retrospect, we can look back at some of the difficulties. Usually when difficulties are happening, we're not very grateful for them, but sometimes you can look back at the difficulties, like even getting into recovery. Many of us feel like I'm so grateful that I'm in recovery. The suffering of addiction that brought me to recovery didn't feel like anything to be grateful for. But now that I'm on this path and I have a practice and I have a community and I'm doing this, I'm so grateful that I was an addict and now get to have this experience of healing and recovery. So sometimes, you know, even the difficulties make our gratitude list. 
Um, there is, uh, so we'll leave it there for tonight. Um, Michelle has posted a link to the donation page. Uh, Refuge Recovery is a, World Services is a nonprofit. Um, any donations that you give to Refuge Recovery are not coming to me. This will all just go to the, to support the organization. Um, I do this um, just out of my service and I, I just show up here to, to support the community in whatever way that I can. And uh, thank you for your generosity. And please do click the link and, and make a donation uh, if you can. It's believed that there's a merit that comes from our joining together and practicing the Buddha Dharma and discussing the teachings. May we gather this merit and share it outward in all directions with all living beings. May each one of us heal, recover, awaken, and together may we create a positive change on this planet. Thanks for tuning in. Good to see everybody and uh, see you uh, next month. I hope a bunch of you I'll see you next week at the conference. Uh, if you haven't registered for the conference yet, you still can. And it's next weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Big Bear, Southern California, residential. Um, but if you have the, I guess, financial ability and freedom of time and schedule, join us for this uh, eighth annual Refuge Recovery Conference. That's a camp out this year and it should be awesome. So I hope to see a bunch of you down here. And